Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. This is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week was catapulted into the international headlines, both on this side of the Atlantic and in the United States, when the private letter that he had written as the British ambassador to Washington was leaked, and it said unflattering things about Donald Trump, as you might expect, um, and, and, and everything sort of went crazy. Kim Darroch was a, a, a lifelong foreign office diplomat who rose up the ranks, um, became Sir Kim and is now Lord Darroch. Um, so, so welcome to the podcast. We're recording this just over a week away from the election, and I'm just wondering whether you're expecting to get the last laugh. <laughs> Good question, Krishna. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, second, look, I've only got uh, the opinion polls to go on and some friends in America that I'm in touch with on both sides of the political divide there, uh, and the assessments they are giving me. And everyone says the same thing, which is that they expect Joe Biden to win and that I think it's also possible the Democrats can retake the Senate as well as holding the House. And the real question is whether it's a blowout, as the Americans call it, a landslide, in which case it would be difficult for Donald Trump to, uh, to argue, or whether it's much closer, in which case I fear we're almost certainly bound for a rerun of um, 20,000 uh, Bush versus Gore and the courts. Now. That's therefore what I have to go on. Of course, um, uh, I'm reminded whenever I hear these assessments of 2016, when Hillary Clinton was ahead in every opinion poll uh, until the one that counted, namely election day. And I still wonder whether the pollsters, although they all claim they've changed their algorithms and their methods, but whether they are genuinely better at picking up uh, Donald Trump supporters. Um, but what sort of persuades me that, that this is the likely outcome of Biden victory is Biden's margins, both nationally, where he's ahead by sometime, sometimes in double figures, and in the battleground states, where he's ahead in, I think, eight or nine out of, out of ten of them, uh, are significantly bigger than Hillary Clinton's ever were, and uh, mostly outside the margin of error for these polls. So um, you kind of think... You know, what more evidence do you need? But um, having lived through 2016, there is still a part of me that wakes up every morning and wonders, are these polls right? If we go back to what happened last summer and Britain was in the middle of this political Brexit crisis and Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt are vying to be Conservative leader, the letter is leaked. Trump comes out and trashes you, as you would expect. But you hang on at that stage. It's only after Boris Johnson pulls the rug away that you feel you have to resign. So ultimately, did Boris Johnson do you in more than Donald Trump? In the end, Krishna, I was already thinking about resignation from the moment that Donald Trump uh, said we will no longer deal with him. And as the, as the evidence started to accumulate, that he meant it, being disinvited to a dinner which Trump was attending with the... Uh, with the ruler of Gutta, for example, being disinvited from a meeting that uh, Liam Fox was having with Wilbur Ross, the US uh, Trade Secretary, and so on. So I was already thinking, well, I'm not really sure I can do this job anymore. Uh, and then other things happened to crystallize that choice. And um, you know what, what the Prime Minister, now Prime Minister, then candidate uh, Boris Johnson said, was a factor but it wasn't the only factor. I wouldn't even say it was, to be honest, the leading factor, um, because lots of other things are coming together in my mind, including conversations with, you know, with my wife about what I should do. And the feeling, honestly, um, I had six months to run. Um, I could imagine if I clung on before Boris spoke, that there would be endless speculation in the media about whether I was going, whether I was going to be uh, invited to, to, to resign or even fired. Um, you can imagine that when the new Prime Minister had his first conversation with, the, with President Trump, 
the media would first would the first question the media would ask, and I don't blame them for this, it's a sensible, obvious thing to do, would be, did Trump raise um, the British ambassador and say, you've got to get rid of him? And what do you say? What did the prime minister say? And I thought, honestly, after 42 years, um, I could do without that. And better to go at a time of my own choosing. So it was perfectly normal, that kind of letter that you were writing. Is, is that what is being sent back all over the world? You know, these sorts of brutal assessments of the leaders that Britain is dealing with? We're only brutal if the judgment of the ambassador and the person on the ground is that that a bit of, you know, reality is, is needed. I mean, for example, I doubt that the current British High Commissioner in New Zealand is sending back brutal assessments of the New Zealand Prime Minister's, you know, landslide victory in, or not landslide, but very comfortable victory in her election. So you call it as you see it. But yes, Krishna, absolutely, um, you don't sort of write in code. You know, we're not lawyers writing on the one hand, on the other hand, we're, we're telling it like it is. You know, ministers may agree or disagree, but but I've been, you know, I was 42 years in the service and I like to think that I re reported with that degree, degree of clarity um, all the time. And uh, it's nothing, it's not unique to the British Foreign Service either. There was a huge dump of US State Department reporting on WikiLeaks about uh, a decade ago. And if you read some of the stuff there, it was pretty sharp as well. I also believe, and uh, that's, uh, that, that's what I'm told as well, that some of the US embassy reporting on, say, our previous prime minister's handling of Brexit was fairly sharp-edged as well. So, yeah, I mean, you're not paid to pull your punches. You're paid to call it as you see it. And how important do you think those dispatches are, you know, in modern-day diplomacy when, you know, people have personal relationships, when foreign secretaries you know, will be on the phone to the US Secretary of State a lot themselves. How important is it that the, the British ambassador in Washington is sending his take back to London? What they don't do, in my judgment, and I worked closely with ministers for more than 20 years, is, you know, you know as well as I do, if not better, just how intensive um, ministerial I mean, political life is, how you're moving from your red box at 5 a.m. in the morning, to a day full of meetings, to statements in the House of Commons, to appearances in front of the media, squeezing into that, uh, reading you know, a long piece in, I don't know, the Times, the Financial Times, wherever, about just how Donald Trump is doing in Washington, it's just not something you can expect people to do. Plus, the idea is that as diplomats, that we're going to get insights and information that is not available to um, to the gentlemen, ladies, the media. Um, so I think it is still crucial to have someone on the ground who is in touch personally with the senior members of uh, the government you are assigned to, sending back frank assessments of how things are going. And let me tell you, I mean, we had ministers over every week in Washington, and the first question they would ask was usually not. You know, what am I going to say to X about this subject on the agenda? It would be, how is how are they doing? How is the administration doing? Is it up? Is it down? Is it stumbling? Is it looking competent? Whatever. And that's just human nature. And you need to be able to answer that question in an informed way. So, yes, this stuff is possible. By the way, um, uh, the letter I sent was specifically commissioned as a frank assessment of the Trump administration's performance over its first six months for a discussion in the National Security Council of, um, of relations with the US and, and you know, the, the buttons to press to deal with the US administration. And you know, there's no more, as you know, there is no more classified forum almost in the British government than National Security Council uh, discussions. So I felt reasonably confident in putting a very frank assessment down for it, because I thought it would just be for um, that senior ministerial discussion. Do you know how it leaked? No. Um, I mean, you'll have read, uh, no doubt, recent reports that someone was arrested. And I think uh, there is an assumption that uh, arrested for the leak of, of my documents. Uh, not just all my, because some of them were, were reporting t cables from the members in embassy in Washington. But an arrest is one thing, 
charging is another and a conviction is another. So there's not really much more I can say on it other than you know, there has been the rest, but um, whether it will come to anything, we shall see. I mean, if you're, if you're right and Donald Trump loses, um, there is now an awful lot of sort of uh, speculation about how much trouble this means for the British government, for, for mm. Boris Johnson in particular, having been so close to Donald Trump. Do you think that's a serious problem? I think it could be. I think it could be for uh, three or four reasons. One, uh, most Democrats, and Joe Biden is on the record uh, in this respect, don't like Brexit and are not huge admirers of the way the Brexit campaign was conducted by the Leave, by the Leave campaign. So, um, so uh, they don't think, unlike Trump administration, it's a great thing that we have left the European Union. Second, uh, you have to look at it in terms of, of US interests. And it seems to me that, that the most important thing for the US to do, um, if Biden wins, the most important thing the Biden administration wants to do is repair relations with Europe. And um, I think that means you know, NATO and the European Union. And I'm not quite sure in terms of raw uh, American interests that we're going to feature that high up the list. Um, third, in terms of repairing the US economy, if, as I hope they do, they think that new big free trade deals is the way to go, the obvious priorities are the, the US joining the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Partnership or reviving the Obama idea, which never got done, finished during uh, the Obama presidency, of an EU-US free trade deal. Either of those potentially bring much, much bigger economic benefits for the US than a free trade deal with us. So it's hard to see why we would be a priority except as a kind of act of charity. Fourth, and this is, you know, there, there's no sort of great personal insight here because it's all over, for example, uh, public statements from people like Ben Rhodes, who was, um, who was Obama's speechwriter. They didn't like some of the things Boris Johnson said about uh, Obama, in particular those comments that he was um, obsessed with our, with our colonial heritage um, in response to Obama saying we'd be at the back of the queue if we chose to, to leave the European Union, we'd be back of the queue for a free trade deal. So there's a lot of stuff stacked up there. Now, I think that the defense and security and intelligence relationship will be as important as ever whether Biden wins or Trump wins, I don't think that's under threat because it's so, so important to American interest to be working with us in those spheres. We, we bring stuff to the ta table, we contribute it. But um, on the other things, um, I just see a co coincidence of US national interests and some resentment about some of the things that the current prime minister said in the past coming together to push us maybe a little bit down the queue. Doesn't mean that you know, it's going to be a disaster. I'm sure that when they eventually meet, um, Boris Johnson and, and Joe Biden will have a perfectly amiable discussion. But I just don't see relations with us being um, a terribly special priority for a Biden administration. How special has it really been? You know, we use this ghastly phrase, the special relationship. Do they really need us for anything other than somebody to stand next to them? when yeah. they want to do something else in the world? I tried not to use it uh, very much when I was in Washington, because I agree with you, it sounds, it sounds needy, but, but we really do contribute in the intelligence and security and defense field. And if we didn't, if we weren't there working with them, collaborating with them exceptionally closely without going into any details, then their resources in those areas would be more stretched. We take the burden off from there. So yeah, that is, that is crucial. It's crucial to us too. We get a huge amount more out of it than the Americans are, but the Americans do get something important out of it. So in that sense, the relationship is special. I think in the cultural and human interaction fields, it is quite special. But when it comes to government to government relations, that's when, that's when national interests really come to the fore. And that's why, you know, in part, why I think that um, that we might struggle a, little, a bit with Biden. But as you say, I mean, your career goes way back and you've seen this relationship quite close mm -hmm. um, over different administrations and different prime ministers. Yeah. You know, is it really a sort of a big brother, little brother sort of relationship? You know, or, I mean, do they effectively tell us what to do? 
it, it, it's gone up and down. And, you know, Clinton major was not especially close, uh, but Clinton Blair was close and Blair Bush, of course, was very close. Um, Cameron Obama wasn't fantastic, but wasn't bad either. Uh, and personally, they got on well. Then, of course, if you go back further, you've got Thatcher and Reagan, which was extraordinarily close. And there have been moments, um, Blair and Bush and the Iraq war, Blair and Bush and um, you know, Afghanistan. Judging by all the reporting I was seeing, um, and sometimes stuff that I was involved in, it was extraordinarily close. And it wasn't, they were just telling us what to do. They wanted us with them, and they were interested in our views, and sometimes took on our views about how to accomplish what we were trying to do. So there was real influence. On the other hand, there have been moments, I say, with real dips. And you remember um, Major and Clinton and John Major refusing to take telephone calls from Clinton for uh, several weeks after Jerry Adams had got his visa to go into the US. And much earlier, when I was dealing with this stuff as head of the relevant Department of Foreign Office, during Bosnia, relations got really, really difficult because the Americans didn't want to be involved on the ground in Bosnia. So UNPROFOR, uh, which was British and French troops basically, was on the ground, were on the ground and Americans weren't. And they were deeply critical of the performance of, of British and American troops in Bosnia, saying we were effectively uh, shielding Serb ethnic cleansing. And we weren't doing anything to stop the Serbs from doing all of that. And I remember some of the most difficult conversations I've ever had with American diplomats in my entire career were in the early, early phase of the Bosnia conflict. So, um, you know, it goes up and down. Let's go back to the beginning of your career then. I mean, you, why did you go into the Foreign Office? Um, it's one of the, um, I mean, most people who join, I guess, had a kind of vocation to join. Uh, for me, I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do when I left university. I knew it was nothing to do with the subject that I had studied, which was zoology. Um, uh, I applied to a number of British multinational companies because I quite fancy the idea of working for a big commercial organization gave me the chance to abroad. And uh, partly on the advice, or actually largely on the advice of my girlfriend at the time, and my wife, um, I applied for the Foreign Office as well, not having expectations that I would get in. And in fact, on the fast stream, which most graduates entered in, I didn't get in first time around. They entered in the slow stream and had to what they called bridge from the slow stream to the fast stream about two or three years into my Foreign Office career. So it was an actor. But honestly, I mean, it sounds banal to say this, but they were the first people to offer me a job. So I thought I'd try it. I mean, do you remember, you know, coming to a to the conclusion that this was something that could change the world for the better. What's drummed into you from the day that you joined the Foreign Office is that you are about protecting and promoting British interests. But as a country with values that tries to do the right thing in the world and that has stood up to tyranny in our past at great national cost, you also believe that projecting and promoting British interests um, uh, also involves protecting uh, and promoting British values. And that if you succeed, that will make the world a better place. Is it clear what British values are? You know, are yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we live in, in very um, uh, confusing times at the moment, but I still think that the, that the majority of Brits basically believe um, in making the world a better, fairer, more democratic, more just place. I think we still believe that. What's happened though, because of the experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan, the idea of humanitarian intervention, which reached its peak um, uh, in Tony Blair's prime ministership, has now become much, much more difficult. And, um, you know, I, I mean, Joe Biden has been 50 years in, um, in American politics and has supported a lot of American interventions in the past. But I notice in his campaign speeches, he's now saying that his objective is to bring American troops home, that he's not, he's not one now for, for more uh, foreign interventions. So, so you know, it's, it just feels much harder 
uh, nowadays. And I mean, the only tool we seem to have nowadays for um, expressing our, our, our opposition to what some countries do is sanctions. And, you know, sanctions are, well, they can be effective, but, but you know, um, equally they can be circumvented. And to have that as the only tool in the toolbox is, um, you know, is, is not adequate. So do, you, so do you think it's true then that having, having had this period, particularly under new Labour, in which foreign policy was about projecting British values, about spreading democracy and supporting the United States in that aim, after Iraq, we've ended up basically with a mercantile foreign policy, which is about Britain first and trade and I think, finances I mean, rather than values? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. The second thing they tell the foreign apart from, you know, it's about promoting British interests, is... And, you know, we succeed or fail as a trading nation by how well we do in terms of trading with the rest of the world. And that's always been uh, the British way as a small uh, island, 64 million people. We need to be outward looking uh, and internationalist. And so you know, promoting Britain's economic interests and commercial interests is, you know, as a bigger part of modern diplomacy as promoting British values and sort of political and defense and security in, uh, objectives. Um, and, you know, when I look back to my time in Washington, even then, even after Iraq and Afghanistan, we had a request from the Trump administration to join them in, uh, in you know, uh, air attacks, missile attacks on, um, on Assad's forces in Syria after he'd used chemical weapons against his own people. Now, strictly personally, um, I regret a lot that we didn't do that back in 2013 when Obama was, I think it was 2013, when Obama asked us and House of Commons voted against it. I regret that Obama also decided not to do it then. Um, and I think the trajectory in Syria could have been different. But even in the last two or three years, we have been intervening, even if only on a one-off basis um, in Syria. So I think you know, with the right international leadership, and you know, that, that has to come from, from the United States, um, there is still stuff that we can do. So I haven't, don't think that's all gone away completely, but, but Afghanistan and Iraq have made it much more difficult because, um, and I think as Biden has said this publicly, he said, you know, nowadays what we would do is a much, you know, we're not going to send people on for, forever wars, they call them. You would go in and you would intervene and you would try and stop something happening. Um, and then, uh, then you pull out. Problem with that, sorry to go on about this, is that's what we did in Libya when we stopped uh, Gaddafi's forces taking Benghazi. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it didn't work there either. If Iraq and, and Afghanistan showed the dangers of getting bogged down in intervention, um, Libya showed the dangers of trying to do it from 30,000 foot. So how much has changed because of Trump? I mean, we don't know whether Trump is, is a blip or, or whether he's here for another four years right now, but you're there in Washington, you've been a career diplomat and you've been doing things the way things have always been done. This man comes in who doesn't play by the rules, doesn't know what the rules are, doesn't know how government works and does diplomacy by Twitter. Yeah. How do you, how do you begin to work out where you stand with that? First of all, you have to, simply your job to make sure the people back in London, and that was again one of the motives underlying that letter I sent after six months of the Trump presidency, that this is a president like none other in American history. Um, this isn't just a slightly sort of rougher edged version of, of, of you know, um, George W. Bush. This is someone who is completely different and who only in certain points touches upon some of the classic tenets of republicanism, um, you know, like free trade and um, standing up to Russia and um, you know, nurturing your allies. Um, so, you know, first thing is to understand that it is completely different. Second, I mean, I think the, uh, the sort of forward looking, how, how much has Trump changed the landscape? If Biden wins, then on the surface, after the transition period, if Trump accepts that he's lost, it can go back to looking reasonably normal on the surface. Um, and you know, Biden will do a more normal um, speech at his inauguration. And I think he will rejoin the Paris climate change deal. He'll probably try to revive the Iran nuclear deal. 
Um, he'll come over early to Brussels for a NATO summit, which he will reaffirm US commitment to Article 5 and all that kind of thing. And people may, may then feel like Trump was just this guy, as you put it, a blip um, on the, you know, in the political landscape, a blip in political history. I'm not sure I, I quite agree with that, because I think Trump has moved the goalposts in a number of respects. First of all, I think any American president in the future will have to push NATO allies harder to spend more on defense, because it's now in the American consciousness that the NATO allies don't do enough. So we won't be able to go soft on that. Second, Trump has talked for five years now, if you count his campaign as well as his presidency, about America doing terrible international trade deals. And uh, I think any future American president, Biden, um, whoever succeeds him, will have to be able to demonstrate that any big international trade deal, whether with Asia Pacific or with the EU or with whoever, really benefits sectors of American industry and agriculture and society. So I think, you know, he's moved the goalposts on future trade deals. They will have to be better for America. Third, um, I think that uh, all the Trump stuff about futility, not that's a word he uses, but uh, uh, these, these, all the blood, the sand and the death of the Middle East and how decisions to go into Iraq and Afghanistan were terrible mistakes and let's bring American boys home. I think that's made foreign intervention a much riskier, you know, much more politically difficult thing for any future American president to do. Fourth, um, you just have to ask uh, I mean, US China, it's now, I think, bipartisan amongst at least the American security establishment, both Republicans and Democrats, that China is the strategic challenge. So I don't see how Biden could do other than pursue uh, US objectives in terms of ch changing Chinese trade practices and also being very critical and maybe introducing sanctions or whatever over US activity in the South China Sea. So Trump has moved the goalposts on China and Biden can't afford to be soft on China. But I think he might multilateralize the trade aspects of this as well and try and get others uh, on board with him. Internally, internally, I just have to say, and this is, uh, you know, you've been over there recently, so you're probably a better place than I am to judge. But I think that the Trump presidency and the way that Trump has handled issues like, like what happened to George, George Floyd I think he has awoken some demons from America's past. And that's quite dangerous. And I think if Biden wins, he will try and, you know, he'll try and be a healing president. But I just think, you know, it's going to take a while. Um, those wounds have been opened up again. And, um, and really, whoever wins, you worry about, you fear that there could be some violence on US streets because especially if Donald Trump says the election has been a fix. His supporters, who you know how fanatical they are about him, are they going to take this, this calmly and just shrug their shoulders? I don't know. One other thing, the Trump style, as you say, presidency by Twitter, the brutal attacks on the opponents, and what I call in the book, the intermittent relationship with the truth. And you could say, since you know, he's still got 80% approval rating amongst Republican voters, 40 odd percent amongst the American people, you know, it's not really done him any harm. So are politicians around the world going to look for their inner trumps to learn or to copy some of the things he does? Has he changed the whole tone of politics? I don't well, know. That's what I wanted to come to. I mean, he already has, hasn't he? And there, there are politicians reaching for their inner trumps um, all over the world and perhaps in, in Britain too. So, I mean, how much do you think he has changed the way diplomacy works? Um, and the way foreign policy works in Britain. You know, if Trump loses, there are still some sort of Trump-style performers around on the international scene who will carry on doing what they're doing. So, so there is a school of Trump imitators, I think, out there um, who are not going to stop. Um, and really, it depends, you know, how successful they are, um, uh, whether there's new populism. Uh, I mean, it'll be a big... I think it'll be a big blow to, to that sort of movement if Trump loses badly, which is possible, but you know, we'll see, we'll see, it's hard to judge. Um, in terms of the UK, it does seem to me that there is a sharper um, uh, Trumpian edge to some of what goes on in our politics, some of the exchanges that go on, um, some of the arguments and how they are conducted. 
if you want something that resembles the enmity between Trump supporters and Trump enemies in the US and the absence of any middle ground, you never meet anyone in America who says, well, Trump's good on this, but not so good on this. And, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle and undecided. You know, you either love him or you hate him. And Brexit seems to me to have followed a similar pattern in the US and the divisions. When you come back and live in this country again, it's just astonishing how deep and how raw those uh, divisions between pro and anti Brexit people are. Maybe that'll heal. Maybe if we get uh, a reasonable deal with the EU on post Brexit arrangements and the damage isn't too bad. Then, um, then, uh, then it'll all sort of calm down. But if it's a no deal Brexit, it proves as bad as some people predict, that's just gonna get worse, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's interesting the sort of the conversations we're having at the moment in that there is this sort of underlying assumption that Trump is on his way out. If he wins again, yeah. we kind of have to contemplate that as well, don't we? And the impact on diplomacy there, because, I mean, do, do you think we have sort of, do you think he has ushered in this sort of age of, impunity that people talk about where you can do whatever you want you can lie you know left right and center you can threaten and use military force and people will just look at that all over the world and go well if he can do it we can do it too yeah look if he wins again especially against the backdrop of being well behind the opinion polls catching covid19 and making this miraculous recovery recovery um he will feel absolutely vindicated and he will think that everything he's been arguing for is absolutely right, and you'll get more and more of it. And what that means, I think, uh, in practice, is um, he will he will continue with his path on climate change, um, which is basically that he's not explicitly a climate change denier. His policies are those that climate change deniers like. Um, um, he will try and do deals with Putin. Uh, which might have as their casualties, for example, international action on what's happened in Ukraine. Um, he will continue to, to put pressure on China to try and do a nuclear deal with, um, you know, with North Korea. And most of all, he will continue to disparage those post-war international structures, largely the ideas of, initiatives of, American statesmen like the United Nations and the IMF and the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, they've already, they're already as disparaged and ignored as they've ever been, and they will struggle to survive another another four years of Donald Trump. And, and, by and do you way, think he will be able to exact any revenge on China for what he keeps calling the China virus? Um, well, he wants a trade deal with China that involves, you know, some big, big concessions from China in lots of areas. Um, and I suspect at the moment the Chinese are waiting it out. Uh, there's lots of tariffs on their, their goods, which are mostly harming, putting prices up for American consumers. But I think the Chinese are just waiting it out to see what happens on the, on the 3rd of November. And if he wins, I think they will come to the table and try and do a trade deal with him. You, you raised Brexit and, and you obviously came under attack when the, the leak happened from Brexiteers as well, um, as a sort of, you know, obviously a Remainer, part of the sort yeah. of Foreign Office pro-European um, conspiracy. Uh, I mean, how, how pro-European was the Foreign Office or is the Foreign Office? Look, I have friends inside the Foreign Office who I believe almost certainly voted Leave. Um, and I know some who did vote Leave. Uh, I suspect the majority voted Remain. Um, probably quite a strong majority. I don't know. I've never conducted a survey. Um, but if you work in the Foreign Office and you believe in our primary task, which is to influence on behalf of British interests, when we leave the EU, you have just lost the chance to sit around that table with 27 other countries and persuade them of British objectives on both the internal development of the European Union and on all the international issues that face us, whether it's sanctions on Russia or you know, where we are in Iran or whatever. So you have suddenly lost a, you know, a crucial, maybe the most important tool we had, and one that Americans thought were, was hugely valuable, judging by the amount they used to lobby us to deliver certain outcomes from EU, EU discussions. So does Brexit make you sad? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it does. It really makes me um, sorry. I mean, I hope for the best in the sense that now it's happened. There's no going back. 
Um, and uh, you know, do you think that's definitely the case? I mean, everybody says that you know that well. We've got to, just got to move on and get on with it. You wonder whether we do. Well, if we were, I remember having a discussion um, just a week and a half ago with with an old friend from my time in Brussels, who's still quite very senior in the system, and he volunteered. I didn't ask him. We didn't dare ask him. He volunteered. If you wanted to come back, we would, of course, take you back. Despite all the angst and anguish and pain you caused us when you were in over all that time, because you bring so much to the table. Um, so, in the improbable, now I say impossible event that, that suddenly the government say, I actually changed our mind, we'd like to go back in. Would the EU take us back? I think, I think they would, but they would say, but of course you come back in on, on the normal terms, which means you're not gonna have a rebate. This is Thatcher's rebate, that's all gone, for example. Um, and you need to, they might say, you need to commit to the Schengen Agreement, which we're only ever on, on, on frontiers, which we're only ever half in. And you need to commit to this and this and this, and you've got to behave yourself in the future. So we wouldn't be coming in on the same terms as if we'd left. I mean, I genuinely believed, um, partly because I was involved in negotiating some of it, that we had the best of all worlds. We were out of the EU policies that we didn't like and in the parts we did like, like the single market. We were genuinely having our cake and eating it. And, and so if, if Europe was to, um, I mean, so, you know, project again, you know, suppose Keir Starmer becomes prime minister in a few years time and, you know, Hmm. Britain still reeling from years of coronavirus and, uh, you know, and is thinking, how can we improve our international standing on trade? Um, it's not looking like it would be an easy re-entry then. No. Do you think no. Europe would, would, would hold us to um, the warning before so. that I mean, we, we'll uh, lose all our opt-outs? I think this is all, I'm not sure we'd lose the, uh, the euro opt-out because uh, to be honest, there are quite a lot of countries that are really the ones with a permanent opt-out, but the countries with a temporary opt-out have no intention of joining the euro quickly. So, you know, I think we get a euro opt-out of some sort, albeit only temporary, will be offered one. Um, but uh, in terms of an opt-out, complete opt-out from Schengen or from um, you know, paying our normal budget contribution without a rebate, I think those are the conditions they would, they would put on us. Um, I think the key question to whether there is ever any chance in the future of our deciding future, apart from the natural flow of politics and losing government in your time, is how are we going to do outside the euro? I mean, I'm old enough to remember us going in um, in the early 70s, at which stage the European Union was performing much, much better economically than we were. And we went in essentially, it was sold to British people as common market for economic reasons. We would do better. We would no longer be the sick man of Europe. If we turn back into the economic weakling post uh, over the next few years and the rest of the EU, albeit all of us are hit by the costs of coronavirus, the rest of the EU is doing much, much better economically than us. Much better growth rates, you know, much more stable currency. Right? Then, I think you can imagine the movement starting to build to say this really was a strategic historic mistake. But I think that, and this is again massively speculative, the route you would take would be to go into a much closer association with the EU where you return to taking some rules from the EU rule book in exchange for access for our services to the financial market and you know, much closer alignment between the UK and the, the EU as a kind of waiting room for who knows what in the future. So it would be a special relationship rather than rejoining as a kind of you know, interim waypoint. But um, as I say, that is pure speculation. Well, ha having spent a career sort of um, trying to change the world subtly and carefully and diplomatically, if you could just change the world, what would you do? Um, if I had one thing that I could do for the UK, I would, I would invent an extra million and a half voters and have the Brexit result come out the other way. Because in, I can't see what it's going to make that's going to be better. Um, I can't see how it's going to benefit us economically. Um, I think, you know, I worry that 
that tens of thousands of people will, will lose their jobs and the economy will take a real hit. Um, I can't see how it's going to benefit um, our friends over in Europe because the EU is weaker uh, as a result. And I can't see how it's going to help what I spent 42 years of my, my front office career doing, which is trying to use, trying to make the most of British influence uh, to pursue our objectives um, and our values internationally, because we no longer have that multiplier in the European Union to, um, through whom we can try to deliver our objectives. So you know, what good is going to come from it? And I mean, are we as a result going to be you know, this vision of, of the UK suddenly you know, bounding free from this international bureaucracy and able to do all sorts of things um, internationally that we weren't able to do before? Or are we just going to be alone and ignored? Kim Darrett, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Milena Dambeli. And I hope if you enjoyed that, do give us a rating and a review. Until next time, bye-bye.